Today's guest is Drew Plotkin. He's an Emmy-nominated producer and founder of the Launch DRTV agency, where he has created and directed award-winning TV broadcast commercials for major celebrities, including Jennifer Lopez, Serena Williams, Cindy Crawford, Ellen Pompeo, Dwayne Wade, Kristen Davis, Jane Seymour, Paris Hilton, Drew Brees, and more. Okay, so he's been around. In addition, he is the founder and CDO, which he calls Chief Dude Officer. So that's gonna give you a little clue about the nature of the show here. <laughs> Chief Dude Officer of the skincare line, Derm Dude. Okay, you guys have got to check out this Derm Dude website. I'm serious. The branding, is, I mean, no wonder, like this is his background, but it is so clever, like so, it's just cool and inspiring. And actually the ingredients are incredible. I was like, oh, okay. So they actually are committed to excellence and they've got cool branding. I like these guys. Um, so they produce products specifically for men's, I'm not joking, men's beards, balls, and tattoos. Yep. <laughs> so keep listening. You want to hear more about that. Um, they are the primary 2022 sponsor for NASCAR driver, Spencer Boyd. Um, and he also co-founded Global Mobility USA. It's a nonprofit that delivers wheelchairs to people in need. What I love about Drew's story as he gets into it is he talks about the journey of like thinking you have it figured out and you know where you're going and then you find some, some success in that area and then something feels wrong and being able to shift and pivot. And sometimes the universe helps us shift and pivot and just hearing his whole journey throughout this crazy adventure that he's been on was so cool. Um, also, we're going to be talking about his book. So his book is called Under My Skin, Bearing It All One Tattoo at a Time. And he's going to get into that whole story as well. Um, um, I just think you guys are going to really enjoy Drew. Here is Drew Plotkin. Okay, so Drew, your book, Under My Skin, Bearing It All One Tattoo at a Time. You know, I, the listeners just heard your bio. Like you've done some, you have not lived a boring life. We'll put it that way. You've done some really, you've had a very interesting life full of highs and lows. And that's really like, really what I want to talk about today. I also want to talk about Derm Dude towards the end of the episode because it's really cool. But like, I want to talk about the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys, the 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 suffering and and the lessons that are learned. I'm a believer that like, you cannot fail as long as you learn something from it. I don't believe in the concept of failure. The only thing that seems like failure to me is if like something went horrible and you just allowed that to completely just destroy you. And most of us who have gone through darkness have, yeah, it's destroyed us for a little while. But if you can extract a lesson from it, especially if you can share it through a book or a podcast or just with your friend, like there's value in that. And especially for us too. So can you talk about some of the, the lessons that you've learned through darkness that have become, it's not to say like, Hey, you gotta have crappy, shitty stuff happen in your life. Like that's, but it, but it does. Right. And you've had some of that. And can you talk about some of the lessons that you've learned in the dark times? No, I, th I think, I think you're saying it really well. And, and the mindset's an important thing too, because there's a difference between, you know, wallowing or, or getting stuck in the darkness versus accepting and embracing that, that, everything in life has to have some type of uh polar opposite you have you, you wouldn't know what hot is without cold you wouldn't know what food tastes good and you like if you've never tasted food that you didn't like um mm -hmm. you know you would never say oh that person's really tall if you had no idea what short was so there's all of those different things and i i really don't believe that you know as human beings we can't truly be happy and comfortable and in a good place in our skin if you haven't had some hard times and, and yeah. the process of growing into that skin and developing who you are and, you know, learning from, from the past. And, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. You mentioned the word fail and not believing in failure. And, and I, you know, I speak about that all the time and I, and I write about it in my book um, because that's been one of the most beneficial things uh, for me to get me from, you know, those valleys back to those peaks. And, you know, we all have valleys and man, they can be low and they can be dark and they can be lonely. They often are and they suck, but it is what we take away with us when we finally, hopefully shorter than longer. But when we leave those valleys, it's what we learn there. That is one going to get us back to those peaks quicker, more often and keep us in those peaks for a longer window of time, which is what we want. But you can't have peaks if you don't know what valleys are. It would all just be flat. You wouldn't yeah. know. So when I think of the word fail, you know, I, I heard the acronym uh, 
a couple of years ago and it just fit perfectly because it's how I was already living in my mind, which was fail F A I L and F first attempt in learning F A I L. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just like the light went off because in many ways, that's what I was already by that point in my life starting to do. It wasn't always that obvious to me, but I, I realized, you know, that along the way through this journey, through this roller coaster, that really what living is, is, learning growing and newness and mm -hmm. if you're not learning if you're not growing if you have no newness you're really not living i mean that's when that's really the opposite of life mm -hmm. uh, by meaning and so for me you know I, i'd reached a point where i didn't want to be bullshitting myself wow this didn't work out the way i wanted it to you know maybe i should be depressed maybe i should be miserable mm -hmm. maybe i should be sad and at times i was about those things but mm -hmm. you know then i i, I looked back and said okay so this didn't end or this didn't have the outcome that i had initially intended i can accept that what happened during this journey this ride this experience that did happen that was positive regardless mm -hmm. of the reason it happened mm -hmm. regardless of what i did or didn't do to make it happen maybe i just got lucky right place right time or maybe i did something deliberately that made a huge impact uh in my favor but what can I take away from this experience, be it a, a bad job, a, a bad relationship, or, you know, something that just didn't end or go the way that you initially hoped. And when you start, it's not really changing the goalposts and it's not kidding yourself. It's saying that, you know, uh, you know, Michael Jordan had a famous saying, I, I can't quote it word for word. It's a long saying, but he talks about in this quote that you see in a lot of locker rooms about every shot that he ever missed every time he took the game winning shot and didn't hit it and all of his different failures. And then he ends it, you know, by saying that that's why he won all of these different championships and everything else, because it's all of those things along the way that put you in that position to get to those peaks where we all want to be. <laughs> Yeah, I I talk a lot of, with my clients uh, in, in the mindset aspect of things of like uh, guilt and shame. It's a, it's a saying I say a lot. Guilt and shame are a cop out, right? Because it's easy. You, you know, basketball, you're reminding me of um, some Kobe motivation that I've watched. And Kobe was talking about how like he kept missing from this one point in the court. He kept he kept falling short. So like some people might be like, well, I suck at that. I suck at three pointers. I suck at blah, blah, blah. That's it. It's just, I'm just going to shame myself and guilt myself. And nobody pass me the ball if I'm there. Cause I suck at that. Right. <laughs> like we can take that route if we like, but he took it as, I guess I need to build some upper body strength. And so he went freaking ham until he could get good at that. Right. And so if we extract the lesson, like you're saying, and just look at those quote unquote failures, it's just like, what do I need to learn here that I know everyone listening has had those moments. I hope you've had at least one moment where you quote unquote failed. And it's like, what? Okay. Let me look inside. What do I need to learn here? And then that massively improved your quality of life. Now uh, you, yeah. Good. You've had some interesting lows. <laughs> what are, I mean, if you don't mind sharing, like what are some of the, the most impacting lessons that you've learned fr from the lows that you've had in your life? Well, I think, you know, I'd break them into different categories. You know, there's the personal, um, you know, in, in terms of family relationship and we can, we can touch on those in a sec, uh, but, you know, to separate out the business ones, mm -hmm. um, which I think also is something that people you know, always want to hear about yeah. especially when you're being real, you know, I've, I've never been a fan of the books and seminars of the guys sitting there behind 12 jet planes and six Rolls Royces. And, and, you know, all you have to do is, you know, buy my, my book and my tape and this will be you in six weeks. And, you know, <laughs> I always say, if you're looking for that, it's not me. I mean, I've, I've made many millions. I've lost it. I've started over again, made it back. And I'm sure I'll repeat that cycle a few more times as much as I would rather just be on the, on, on the upside. Uh, and maybe some of the lessons I've learned, you know, this time will keep me there. Um, but, you know, along the way, the things that had the biggest impact, oddly, were the things uh, on the journey, especially from the beginning. You know, my my first real career attempt, you know, out of college was TV news journalism. And that's what my degree was in. And I had my whole life, I'd wanted to be a, a journalist and on air TV reporters is obviously before, you know, all the tattoos and, you know, everything else. And, you know, I even say to people, and I know you, you've read the book, but in the book, I, I talk about that I've been on death row twice. And normally when I say that now people jump back from me, and like, what did you do? How did you get off? You know, did you get, and it was as a journalist. I mean, I was, 
you know, 16 years old in high school. And we had a project where you had a lot of flexibility. And I said, I want to interview another juvenile my age, someone on death row, because I thought it was a fascinating human story. So I, it took about a year, but I ended up doing that. And later in, in, you know, my early twenties, I was a TV news producer and ended up interviewing another person on death row somewhere. So I've always had a passion for storytelling. I thought journalism was my path especially mm-hmm. as a younger person, it really wasn't like today, you know, 30 plus years later, where it's very normal to have six, seven, eight different careers. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when I went to college, I got a degree in journalism and you're, you know, you're going to go into journalism. That's why you spent all that money and spent that time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, there are parts of it I was good at, but I, I bombed miserably at my on-air audition. Um, mm-hmm. I remember it like it was yesterday. And, and the reason I bombed wasn't because I wasn't ready. It wasn't because I didn't want it bad enough. It was, I psyched myself out. It Mm. was that I had built up in my mind, literally. And I talk about it in the book where walk into anything. I always say that, that nobody can walk up to the plate in the ninth inning in the world series. Uh, And I say in the book, you know, about to shart yourself that you're so nervous thinking, don't, don't screw up. Don't strike out. Oh my Mm -hmm. God. If you strike out in front of the world, this game's over. You're not going to go up and hit a home run. (laughs) You're lucky if you don't trip and fall on the plate. That's what I did. That's what I did. Going through my mind was, don't mess this up. Don't mess this up. You've wanted this since you were a kid. You've wanted this mm, your whole life. So much pressure. For this. Don't let anyone, <laughs> you know, so I, I was like this. And, you know. Totally. So that was one of those things where that that experience, that time in my life obviously didn't work out. And and it was dark, you know, compared to some things that everyone experienced beyond that. And certainly I later did experience things much darker and, and deeper. Uh, and I'll share those. Um but at the time, man, that was everything. I was like a 22, 23 year old kid's world, like falling apart. Like, where do you go from here? There was no backup plan. There was no anything else. And later in life, you know, that really was one of the key drivers for me because it gave me so many lessons. And I look back mm-hmm. and I said, man, I, I learned to write TV news copy in, in live in eight seconds, how to tell a short mm-hmm. little snippet of a story, how to use video and pictures and editing and graphics and, mm-hmm. and all the things that I ended up learning. And I learned there's no guarantees, but if you psych yourself out, that's the guarantee that you won't succeed, you know, how yep. not to do that to myself and realize, okay, that doesn't work. Don't do that again. You mm-hmm. know? And, mm-hmm. and I, I came up with a saying, cause one of the guys said to me afterwards, when I was so down on myself, he'd say, Hey man, it's only live TV. It's only live TV. Let's go get a beer. And I remember up until he said that to me, my life was live TV mm-hmm. news. It's, it's all that I knew, but really it's just live TV. Go get a beer, man. Your mm-hmm. life is not over just because something didn't have the exact ending. It really is just an arc, like a river to what is the next path? What can you take from that? Mm-hmm. And that, that was 25 plus years ago. And there's so many things from those 18, 19 months I spent in Reno, Nevada, behind a little cubicle, producing TV news, not really happy, pretty lonely, freezing my ass off because Reno's cold most of the time. And, and yet there's so many things specifically that I can pull from that window of time that have benefited me so many times along my life in successful peaks and and to this day. And I had the same exact experience when I was a telemarketer. Um, I had the same exact experience working in in the restaurant food industry, bartending for years, something as mundane as bartending might see. uh, You know, I used it as an opportunity to say, what can I take away from this beyond just pouring Mm -hmm. drinks, meeting girls and getting free drinks, you know, after Mm -hmm. my shift, you know, and Mm -hmm. that's the deliberate choice. It's a mindset. And again, you know, it's in a 30 minute chat. You can't get into all of it, but in the book under my skin, I really spend, you know, a chapter on, on so many different business experiences um, that, you uh, you know, as you're reading, you're like, oh, that poor bastard, he must've been miserable. But then you, you really see that, Fortunately for me, I was able to take some of those experiences in each case that really played a huge role in my biggest successes to this day. Yeah, man. Expectations are such a bitch, man. Yeah. <laughs> they, they were, it's like, I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, what if, you know, weight loss, for example, it's like you get in your mind that by the end of this month, you're going to lose seven pounds. And what if you only lose six and a half pounds and you, it, now you failed, you suck. It's like you just lost six and a half pounds. Oh my gosh. You know, but when you have that expectation, it's like, nope, it can only go this way. And if I don't do exactly what that arbitrary thought in my mind was at one point, then I can't see the value in any of this and it just removes all joy. Another reflection, uh, you're reminding me so much of something. Um, I'm in a mastermind with a guy, a business guy, his name's Scott Duffy. And he speaks on all these stages and he 
was speaking with Les Brown. Do you know Les Brown? He's like amazing uh, P- speaker. P- P- PBS guy? Uh, uh, yeah, he did have a PBS show. Yeah. And he just, I, said, um, I love Les Brown. I, I think, so, I think I'm doing his show in a few weeks. I just got to think. Oh, okay. Yeah. He, awesome. I, and I'm I, pretty I, sure I did Scott Duffy's podcast last month. Does he have a podcast about tickling and stuff? Is that his I don't or know not? if he, I don't know. Could be a different like, Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, different Duffy. Yeah, he's like an entrepreneur guy. He's like the, okay. he used to interview everybody for Entrepreneur Magazine and .com and okay. you know big entrepreneur guy. But uh, he was it was his first time speaking on a really really big stage with like Les Brown and all these guys, right? Young guy, and he's he's like he's he's like a he's a very sweet person. He was like I was so nervous, like so nervous. And Les Brown comes up to him and goes, he's like, Hey man, how you doing? And he's like, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. And he said that Les goes nervous nervousness is the ultimate form of selfishness. Get over yourself and go serve those people. Right. And I, I thought of that as like, in terms of like, when we're pressuring ourselves so much that when we feel nervous, it's like, when, for me, that helps so much. I'm like, what, why you mean? What, what's this is all about you? It's all about you right now. Get out of your way and go and go serve, you know? And, and, and then again, just reflecting on the, the, the lessons, right. I also studied journalism. I was big into journalism in high school and studied communications in college. And, you know, I look at it now when it's like, well, I do use that stuff. I on social media, podcasting, coaching, speaking, like definitely not what I thought it was going to be, but you know, if we can extract the beauty of how everything in our path has helped us along the way, we can be filled with gratitude versus disappointment, you know? (laughs) So I, I I spent, you know, 15, 20 years in Los Angeles, you know, running an agency I started and uh, we, you know, helped build and develop, you know, and run some of the most successful skincare, personal beauty care brands, you know, out there, many, I'm sure that, that, you know, most of the people listening have, would know if they saw on TV or on digital and celebrity brands and, you know, worked with all of the A-list Hollywood celebrities and pro athletes around the world and everything. And ultimately the thing that was really my fire and my passion was, man, but I want to be doing this for me. And in many ways I was, I mean, I owned this agency at, at our peak, we had you know, 35 employees and, you know, doing over $10 million in billings and all these crazy things. It was just wonderful, but I, I, I will not say that I was fulfilled and that was okay because mm-hmm. I wasn't lying to myself. I wasn't telling myself you're fulfilled because everybody looks at you right now and says, wow, you've got it all. You've, I was grateful for the things that I had, but in here, I knew that something was missing. I knew that mm. I wanted, you know, my own brand, my own, mm. uh, my own brand, really, and instead of, mm. you know, r- running them for everybody else. But instead of being, you know, angry and, and bitter during that window, I really looked at it as, uh, you know, a 15, 20 year lesson in what to do when I yeah. have the opportunity to run my own brand and, and what will my brand be? And I didn't know at those times what it was going to be. And I would think about things, but none of it felt like, okay, that's it. And, you know, it, when, when the idea and concept of Derm Dude, you know, came up, people say, how did you find that idea? how did you find that concept? And I, I go, it kind of found me, man, because it, it kind of, it was me, you know, and mm-hmm. I, I talk about it in the book It just being at this point in my life, almost turning 50 years old and, you know, looking for products for my own tattoos and looking for products to help with my own beard, which was really patchy and shitty and flaky and mm-hmm. itchy at the time. And, you know, all of these other things and, and, you know, men's grooming and like, here I am 15, 20 years in the, the grooming skincare beauty world. And, and, you know, we sold over a billion and a half dollars of products for all of these different brands combined. And I would be walking the aisles of Target or something and texting and calling, you know, you know, women I know, asking them for suggestions on a good shampoo or a good what what will work with my beard, what will help my beard not be dry. And if I really want my tattoos to heal faster, be brighter. And I didn't know any of that. You know, I, I knew a lot about skincare and personal care for women. But here I was, a guy about to turn 50 mm-hmm. and realized that there really was not a genuine, authentic men's grooming hygiene brand and certainly not one that i felt could be as as you know how we are i mean like you were talking before and you know you're you're laughing about some of the things on our website and the names of some of our products i mean you know for me to get to have i mean this is our 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 viral product this has over six million views on tiktok and it's called happy sack nut love cooling cream (laughs) <laughs> and it's phenomenal. And yeah, I mean, everyone pisses in their pants when they hear the name, but then when they use it, it's like, we have like 
you know, thousands of reviews literally of, of like, this isn't, uh, this product's unbelievable. Like I bought it cause it, I thought it was funny. I believed what the guy was saying, but I didn't know that the product was really going to do anything special. And then they're like, Oh wow, this guy was in skincare and formulations and worked with labs and dermatologists for 15, 20 years prior to starting this brand. Maybe there's something to this. And, you know, that's been the cool part that I never could have put a business plan together for Derm Dude if I sat down at a computer because my business plan was the 15, 20 years leading up to it. And even before that, that that was my business plan happening then in real time. Yeah, it was all working for you because if you just randomly out of the gate, like I'm going to start this, think how much harder that process, you had so much knowledge, so many contacts, like it wasn't your first rodeo. So you were able to express your creative freedom with all of this knowledge, all of this wisdom. And I, okay, hold on. I want to talk about Derm Dude for just a second. And I still want to go back to tattoos and a few other things. But like when I was looking at through your stuff in preparation for this, you know, I was like, I'm like, okay, okay. I, I pull up Derm Dude and I'm like, first of all, there's like a love, I mean, right now there's a love sack set, which cracked me up because I already knew some of your branding. And there's like the products are like Amaze Balls and Happy Crack <laughs> and Ballgasmic Sack Wash, <laughs> right? So you guys kind of get the idea. But then on top of it, I was looking at your ingredients, you know, and it's like activated charcoal and, and, and coconut oil and, you know, giving guys biotin for their beard growth and gummies and aloe vera sprays for tattoos. And I was like, oh, okay. So like, this is also like quality natural ingredient products. Can you, a couple of things. One, I want you to talk about like the moment, like when did this, ha like what happened? Like when was the like, when was Derm Dude born? Like what shifted in you? Because you're right. You were in this kind of like safety net of like, I'm doing like huge stuff in the world for all these A-list celebrities. Like you're comfortable. So like, what was the moment that led into this creation of your own baby? Well, but believe it or not, and I, and I say this, you know, in a, in a balanced way, because I don't want people to say, oh, he thinks COVID's wonderful and all these people died. But, but you know, when COVID first really hit, and we're in Los Angeles, so we were locked down and we probably had, you know, as extreme measures, mm -hmm. you know, for us here as anywhere in the country, if not more, mm -hmm. for the longest window of time. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're a production agency. Like I said, at that point, we had about 27, 28 full-time employees all here, editors, graphics, everything else going on from here. And it shut down overnight. So not only could we not film or shoot anything for at least six months, and even when we were allowed to start shooting and filming again, you know, you had to have hazmat suits and so many rules and regulations that it, it trickled. I mean, it was people just weren't it, it mm -hmm. changed everything, at least for mm -hmm. a long while. And 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 we all of our editing, you don't edit if you're not shooting. So we, we literally had nothing overnight. And Previously, before COVID, uh, about a year or two before, maybe even a little longer, I had taken a trip to Bali, and I talk about it in the book, and it had really been a life-changing experience. I had experienced something very, very painful mm -hmm. personally, um, mm -hmm. it was suicide of someone very close to me, mm -hmm. and I wanted to come up with a, a specific tattoo that really was just not just a, this person died, remember me, something that really, to me, spoke to the entire experience the journey of life with that person without that person hereafter my own process of the pain and the hurt but also the healing and the next step so there's a lot that was going into that piece there was a, a specific tattoo artist who was in bali at the time he's a just really mm -hmm. elusive eccentric dude beyond belief does incredible pieces and he agreed to do the piece went to bali did a two-day tattoo on my chest pretty exceptional the way it all worked out um, again, a lot of these things I'll spend a chapter going over in the book on, but I'm rushing through it right after the tattoo was done. I only had like another, you know, 24 hours total before I had to get on the plane back to the U S. So I got in a, in a, I guess a, a cab or something and went to a town uh, called Ubud, U-B-U-D, which actually means medicine. I didn't realize that at the time. Mm -hmm. And to make the most of my time there, one of the things I did was hike an active volcano called Mount Bator, which you can do. And a lot of people have done, you can look online. It's fantastic. But you get there when it's pitch black, super dark, early morning, freezing cold, because the idea is to get right to the top of the volcano, right as the sun rises and breaks the horizon it's just magical if you can catch it so i'm probably you know two days full days of chest tattooing you know your chest is raw it's you know a puncture wound you know a mm -hmm. tattoo people don't realize it is trauma for your skin i mean mm -hmm. the average tattoo needle is 50 to 3,000 piercings and punctures a minute in on your skin um 
So we get up and I'm at the base of Mount Batur, probably, you know, 15, 20 hours after the tattoo was first finished. I'm wearing layers and layers to keep warm, a white t-shirt on the bottom. And it's a volcano. So there's like rock and ash and chalky, charcoaly ash everywhere. And, you yeah. know, things that would be on a volcano and we're hiking and we're going up and I'm following the guide and all you have is a little headlamp and you're, you know, it's, and, and man, then you start to sweat, you're dripping sweat and you lose one layer, you lose another layer. And, you know, we finally get to the top and I, and I saw the most spectacular, unbelievable experience of my life. Um, that was almost out of body um, and, and got, goes on to bigger and different things for me. But what I also realized is that white t-shirt I had put on at the start of the hike is my base level was like black. And I looked down at first, I'm like, Oh, I thought I put on a white t-shirt. Like, <gasps> like my t-shirt was black from like soot and volcanic ash and everything. And my brand new tattoo. And I just tried to like pierce back my shirt and it was like stuck because you're still oozing plasma and blood mm -hmm. fluids after a new tattoo like of all mm -hmm. the things in the world that you should not do right after a new tattoo hiking a volcano uh is one of them of all <laughs> the dirt and pollutants i mean you could think of you know maybe jumping into a vial a big thing of acid would also be very bad but like <laughs> other than that like you'd, you'd be hard pressed to find something stupider to do so I was certain that this thing was going to get infected and, and just ruined and destroyed and whatever else, but I had to go fly home. So on the way to the airport, literally the, the driver was very nice. And we stopped in the town of Abood and I ran in and I mean, I got, you know, lotions and potions and creams and anything and everything I could fit into a carry on. And while I was on the plane, I was like trying to clean up and experimenting on myself. And mm -hmm. ultimately the tattoo did not get infected. It ended up healing well. And, and what that really did, it wasn't that I found like a magic ingredient on a roadside stall in the middle of Bali and I actually tell <laughs> people that having been in the skincare and beauty industry for 15, 20 years, usually 99.9% .9 of the time when brands or people talk about these magic elusive ingredients they're absolutely full of shit i can tell you i've been in those meetings i've been part of the pitches i've been part of the execution i've been part of the script writing for all of those years if there is something super magical and rare that does something super incredible people are going to find it it's going to be out there or there's going to be more to it than sh someone showing up on your tv at two in the morning talking that only they found it uh, it just doesn't work that way what really makes the difference is being smart about the products, working with good labs, working with good doctors, working with good formulators, testing over and over again, using the very best ingredients. But here's the, here's the hook. A lot of people, a lot of brands don't want to use the best ingredients. Why? Because they cost more money. Mm -hmm. And then when they use even the best ingredients, a lot of times they use just a little bit of it in the formula, tiny percentages. And we, we have a term for that. It's called fairy dusting or mm -hmm. marketing levels. And it's a way that big brands to this day, many of the ones that people are shopping, not all of them, but people listening are, are shopping. That is a legal way that, that brands hoodwink uh, customers and have mm -hmm. been doing it forever. Yep. So in other words, like in our products, when you mentioned some of those ingredients like activated charcoal, we use cucumber, we use uh, rosemary leaf extract. These are really great ingredients. We use a high percentage, the highest percentage that the formulas will actually bear be efficacious, but also good for your skin, soothing, mm -hmm. calming. That way we put it on the label. These are the ingredients. Someone else who might want to use activated charcoal or some of those same ingredients and says, oh, those are great. People are going to think those are great ingredients. They can put in a micro touch. They can put in a pinprick mm -hmm. and still on the label say that they put in those same ingredients. That's because the labels don't say the percentages. Mm -hmm. So so for me, one of the things starting Derm Dude was, yeah, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm trying to introduce men like myself into the world of men's grooming, men's hygiene with some information that I never had, that we never had. I wanted to do it in a fun, funny way. Why? Because I want to have fun at this point in my life. You know, I'm 50. I mean, I've been, you know, through a lot of different things. And if it's not going to be fun, I don't want to do it. And I mm -hmm. believe that most guys actually want to have fun. And I think mm -hmm. that making something fun is a good way to get someone to stop and listen for a second and take mm -hmm. part in a dialogue. And you could say, hey, you, over there, listen to this, or you could try to scare people. You know, your nuts are going to fall off if you don't use it. I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's not my thing. Mm -hmm. I'd rather come up with names for a product like Balgasmic Sack Wash, have someone laugh a little bit, and then when they hear about it, say, man, I absolutely want to use that. Okay, it's it's 
charcoal is effective at cleaning, but it's soothing and it's comforting and it's not too abrasive. And, you know, then I can explain to someone and say, why do we actually use ingredients like activated charcoal? Well, the reality is when you're talking about your sack, your package, your balls, your junk, whatever you want to call it, the truth is, and a lot of people don't know this, and you don't need to, but you need the information, is that there are good bacteria and bad bacteria. Our body secretes a lot of different things, different types of oils. And the reality is, is that when you use something like activated charcoal down on your package as a guy, you're getting rid of the bad bacteria, but you are leaving and not stripping down there the things that your body produces naturally that are good for you. So you don't want to use an abrasive cleaner. Otherwise, we could just use rubbing alcohol all over our body. And, and what would that do? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the idea of formulating good products is understanding and knowing, working with experts, not always needing to be the smartest guy in the room, but needing to know that you can surround yourself with the smartest men and women in the room and experts, being willing to invest in it, make making the decisions that this isn't a short term. I don't want to sell one product to everyone in the world and have a bad experience. I want people to have a really good experience and come back over and over again. And if I don't really start making good money until the fifth or sixth time, as long as there is a fifth or sixth time, because I had a good experience and that's a business. Mm -hmm. And th that's really been the mindset and then information. And, you know, really for us, our 90% of our marketing is I sit right here and I talk about the products and I talk to people and, you know, we started doing this about six, seven months ago. And one of the very first videos on TikTok we posted, I think now has almost 6 million views. And it was me talking about ball care for 30 seconds. And I didn't even know how to use TikTok. I learned it from my six-year-old twins who were on the app, on the phone. I'm like, how do you do that? And I was back in July of last year. And now it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just hilarious. I've been called an influencer doing media tours and all these different things, <laughs> but there's no script. I mean, we don't script anything. It's just, me sitting here talking about the products or me out somewhere and having our real customers and real people sharing their experience. And, you know, the customer is the only person I report to. That's what I say. They're like, who's your boss? I'm like, it's the customer. That's, that's who I care about. Mm, I love that, uh, that the whole shutdown, especially being in LA, my best friend lives in LA. So I was like, Oh my gosh, like girl, I'm glad I don't live in LA right now. I'm not going to lie. That sounds really intense. Um, but like and, it was and to go back to your thing. I'm so sorry. I mean, but it, mm. it goes back to your whole message about hard times and what can you learn? Yes, from them. And exactly. At the outset of the pod at the outset of the pod at the outset of the of, of the shutdown, I sat in my office here and watched 27 people have to leave. We couldn't work remote. We weren't set up at that point. Our editing base, our, everything's here technically. And in my mind, I was like, man, am I going to lose my house? Are my kids going to be able to go to college? How am I going to even pay these people? I wasn't obligated to, but I felt a responsibility mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't have, you know, deep, deep savings at that point. And um, I, someone had sent me a, a, an email and shared a quote in it that I actually found really effective. And it wasn't original. It's been redone by people, but it was every crisis creates opportunity. And that really, I had two mantras during COVID before I had any idea of like launching Durham Dude and all of these other things and before our podcast. And I literally was, every crisis does create opportunity. And I was saying, okay, th this is going to be a, a, a doozy that we're in right now. What opportunity is going to be there that if I don't feel sorry for myself and I don't sit there and mm -hmm. stare at the clock saying, when is this going to end versus what can I do now? Exactly. So that became it. And, and my other mantra became survive to thrive. I knew that it was going to be a, a, a very hard and long road to survive financially, mentally, emotionally, everything. I'm going to have four kids and all the different factors that were going into it at the time and at the time, 27 employees. So it wasn't just, I just wanted to hang on. I didn't want to hang on to the side of the boat and tread water unless I knew that once I got picked up by that boat, man, I was going to the fucking Bahamas. <laughs> it was going to be nice. Mm -hmm. And and I, I really, you know, I hit the gas. I mean, I know it sounds mm -hmm. stupid, but I mean, I drained, you know, myself emotionally, mentally, um, you know, and, and, you know, financially and, and started investing not in one, two, three or four products. I mean, we started with tattoo, but every product we developed was not cheap <laughs> rounds and rounds of formulations mm -hmm. development. And if we didn't get it 110% right, we started over or we walked away or we fixed it or we didn't do it. It was not a, well, we need money. Now we're going to sell this. We, we just didn't. I mean, we really didn't start selling product for real with any marketing money or budget or effort probably until like almost, almost a year after we started developing and investing in the products, because mm -hmm. we wanted to get the products right. First and foremost, before mm -hmm. we really, you know, walked it out to the world. 
Huge props because I've, I've also had the wool pulled off my eyes in terms of the health industry with supplements. And I've seen the dark side of that, every single thing that you're talking about. And I've, you know, without going into detail, like I, I, I know people who are showing up in business that way. And I know the insides of how they operate and it's the fairy dusting and that whole approach. And I have literally been in the experience of seeing somebody say, like talking about their products to them. And I can feel the energy from that person. Like, yeah, yeah. Like they, it's the way you're approaching it. I call it how to sleep well at night business approach. The other approach is, yeah, you might rack in your millions, but like that moment when somebody's like, Hey, uh, my wife is really sick and we were thinking about using your product and you got that, like your stomach is about to drop to the floor. Cause you don't even know if your product is good. And yeah. like you would recommend it to a man standing in front of you who's saying his wife has cancer or something and wants to use your product and you feel like you just want to vomit like that. Is, there is no amount of money in the freaking world that is worth losing your integrity over. And yeah, it's not always the the popular path to take, but it is like it w- Oh, I, I mean, I've interviewed so many amazing people like planet, you know, uh, wild planet, the way they, they fish and they it's one line at a time. And like, they're like, no dude, I'm doing it right. Or, you know, my friend who owns a mineral company, same path. Like I've heard him on the phone because one of my close friends, he's like, no dude, we, I don't want to have to throw a whole batch away. Like we're only sourcing from that. You know what I mean? And that commitment, it's like, you can sleep well at night. You're proud of like that, the inner, and then that energy, it's like, in my opinion is going to lead to more business success because you feel good about what you're doing. You're like, no, this actually helps people. So like, let me give more of that, you know? So huge, huge props on that. And, um, I guess I, the, uh, before we end, I want to get more into the tattoo thing, you know, like (laughs) we haven't, we kind of, you have any Tara, I have, I have one, uh, that I want to evolve. Is is, is it Chobel or is it a a wonder woman? It's a, there's a story. That's fun. That's, that's fun though. Yeah, well, there's the, a huge backstory to it. Maybe I'll tell it someday, but it's um, it's going to be evolved. In ayahuasca, it turned into an eagle that guided me through my entire journey. So I'm going to evolve it into that, you know, but... You didn't um, do the tattoo while you were doing ayahuasca. It was the vision that came, right? Or did you yeah. tattoo while... <laughs> It's very symbolic of my life journey, you know, and I, I think we can, you know, I only have one, but I've, I, you know, can you talk about the, in terms of your, your tattoos and why you wrote your book about this and, you know, brought the tattoos into the story? Yeah. I mean, I mean, my book, you know, as you mentioned at the outset, it's called under my skin. Um, and you know, the tagline is bearing it all one tattoo at a time. Um, and look, my, my tattoos have, have written my life story for me and vice versa. Um, you know, the Egyptians had hieroglyphics, um, you know, uh, the, the Greeks, you know, wrote in stone tablets. Um, for me, my tattoos have always been my therapy, um, uh, my best therapy. I refer to myself in the book and in, in life as a giant post-it note. Um, and that's what these really are. They're my reminders. Um, most of them are enigmatic or, you know, they're not overtly clear to the average person Mm -hmm. and it's not intended to say, Oh, you can't look, but it's intended to have special meaning for me personally. So, you know, Mm -hmm. when I look down at my hand each day and I have a, a, a broken glass clock and you see the glass is broken on the clock and the birds are flying away. Um, that was when my oldest daughter was only eight years old. And I realized that I, despite my previous reminders to myself and my attempt, I was not living in the moment. I was not being as present as I mm-hmm. knew I needed to be wanted to be. So this tattoo is called time flies. And it was a constant mm-hmm. reminder on my hand that time will fly. It does. It goes so quick with my kids, with my daughter. Mm-hmm. And I set the clock to seven 11, uh, on the clock, which that's her birthday, July 11. So, you know, again, the average person is going to say, oh, it's a cool clock. I like the glass. But mm-hmm. to me, that that's not what I'm going for. It's right. my everyday, you know, reminder. I mean, I have tribe on my hand because my people who are the closest to me, the few that I, you know, trust and would jump in front of a car for and would do the same for me. And that's my, my tribe, you know, and that's has such a special meaning to me, mm-hmm. um, you know. Uh, so throughout my body. um, without realizing it, I did not realize that I was being so therapeutic or self-help oriented, but that is what I started to do. And all Mm -hmm. of a sudden, you know, you get to a certain point after 20 years of doing that 25 years and you look back in the mirror and see, man, you've taken up quite a bit of real estate, but each piece had so much meaning to me, even the simplest ones. I mean, I have on my finger here, just, you know, scribbled in script, no plan B. 
And mm. for me, that was always my reminder years ago that, you know, there is no plan B, whatever you're focused on, you know, get to it. You'll have stops along the way. You might have detours, but I don't go backwards. I always say, I'll mm -hmm. go to the left, to the right. I'll tunnel under, I'll climb over, mm -hmm. whatever it is. I'm not stupid at this anymore. I'm not going to run headfirst into a brick wall mm -hmm. anymore, um, mm -hmm. but I'm not going backwards. And for me, that's what a little note mm -hmm. of no plan B is, you know? Mm -hmm. So some of them are big, some of them are small. You know, I have a quote from Hunter Thompson that I love, which is buy the ticket, take the ride and a little paper airplane just zipping across my thumb. Um, which is, you know, again, speaks to me personally about, mm -hmm. you know, get on board, man, take the journey. Don't always sit there and say to yourself, well, how do I know where this bus is going to let me off? How do I know where this train stops? Don't always be so set on knowing where something ends. Mm -hmm. Try to try to put a little more emphasis on the journey itself and, and mm -hmm. seeing where it takes you, you know? Mm. And so, you know, um, for me, every single tattoo, some of them are big, you know, last couple months ago, I did a 16 hour tattoo on my back, which took up half my back from an incredible artist in, in Hawaii. Um, but most of my tattoos are individual, smaller pieces that just all run together now and, and really tell my own story. But, you know, when someone comes up to me on the street and says, why do you have so many tattoos? And usually I'll just say, well, I have something to do when I'm online in Starbucks, I can read, you know, and, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. I love this so much. You know, my, my, I, I relate a lot because actually this Wonder Woman tattoo I have comes from the darkest time of my life. And I hated this tattoo for a while. Hated it. I was like, just, it's just a reminder for me to not be a freaking idiot is where I was at. I was not in a good place for a little while with it. Right. And ayahuasca like completely healed that for me. And so evolving it into this eagle that it turned into and, but keeping it prominent because it's much like your journalism story. You know, for me, it's like, that was such an instrumental part of my path. Like I needed that. I am grateful for that now. And to be able to have something like that on your body that reminds you of that, it's so personal. It's a, it's, a, I would call it, it, people can have their different opinions. So to me, it's like, it's self-love. It's like having a relationship with yourself. It's like, mm, like through intention, I'm going to like have that little moment with myself by seeing that. So I, I so relate. And, um, I well, think we'll skin, go Your skin is your largest living organ on your body. And, and a lot of people don't stop and think that, you know, if you said, now, if you said to most guys, what's your largest living organ, you know, most of them are going to say something different, but it is your skin. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's alive. Yeah, You know, your skin's alive. Your tattoos yeah. are alive. They're a living, breathing part of you. So I'm glad that you kept your Wonder Woman tattoo. And whether you expand it and do something with it or keep it exactly as is, I think either way, it's absolutely perfect for you. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I, I know my health conscious people are going to be like, Tara, tattoos are toxic. But I'm not as much of a purist as some of my <laughs> some of my they're, health they're friends. I'm like, now. I'm like I feel like. Ink. Yeah. I'm like, okay. I'm like, I feel like my body's got it so far. Haven't, you know, <laughs> nothing's happened, <laughs> but anyway, um, guys, we're going to link up dermdude.com is the name of the website. Please check it out. It is so funny. I was, I was texting it to friends. I'm like, look at the, look at this branding, look at these, the names of these products and like the, the kits and stuff. So it'll probably also make a really, really awesome gift. Um, and yeah, really impressed with all the ingredient lineup and just, just everything. And then we'll also link up your book, which again is called under my skin, burying it all one tattoo at a time. Um, thank you for taking the time, Drew. What a crazy journey you've had. And uh, it's just awesome to hear you tell the story. You are right. Like t t storytelling is a gift. So thank you for coming on and doing that today. I love speaking with you. You have a great energy. So anytime you want to do it, I'm around. Thanks. Thanks.